Welcome to another edition of Dental Dentalpreneur Secrets. And I am so excited that you are here with us today. And by the time we finish, you're going to know what the value that you bring to your organization is. More importantly, you're going to know how to have maximum impact on your organization. And you're going to feel more in control about where you're headed than ever before. And I am so excited to have Justin Hebert here today. Justin is an executive success and mindset coach, and he helps business owners just like you tackle those mindset problems, performance issues, and human resources. Justin, welcome to the show. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much. So glad to be here and uh, learn from you and hopefully help your audience along the way. It, it's going to be a fantastic conversation today. And, you know, a, a lot of what you deal with is really sustained high performance. Talk to us a little bit about sustained high performance and why that matters. Yeah, so for for me, it, it began on this journey and let's see, 2014, 2015, uh, I started doctoral school. Uh, really, at the time, I was, uh, I was a pastor at a small church in Denver and looked back through the church history and realized like, well, the pastor before me left in burnout and the pastor before him left in burnout and the past, and there was this cycle. And so I started doctoral school as, I, I suppose, as much of a commitment to myself as to the church and everybody else. Like, I don't know what I'm doing at all, but I want to do this the right way. And so I started to just research issues around, hey, why do we have successful high achievers that all of a sudden falter and fail and fall off the face of the earth, right? We, we have those kind of what we might term as like, you know, those overnight successes, whether they are or not that become the next hot thing or the next hot author for six months. And then they wrote one great book and you never hear from them again. And it turns out they, you know, they squandered everything. And that really became uh, for me where I was at in, in my own life and particularly in doctoral school, just a passion of like, how do you not just attain success, but how do you attain sustainable, achievable, repeatable success that continues to grow with you through the years? Hmm. I, and as you've started to, to study this, what are some reasons that that burnout happens? Because I know exactly what you're talking about. So many people, you know, they come up with that new idea or they'll start a business and the first year or two is really good. And then everything gets hard and it all falls apart. And so, so what are some things that you found as you've been studying this sustained high performance? What are some traits and characteristics of people who do this? Are, are they naturally born to do this or can you learn how to do this? Uh, Everybody wants to know, right? And, and John Maxwell is kind of famous for saying our leader, you know, when somebody asks him, are leaders born or are leaders made? He goes, well, leaders are born every day. The problem is they never get made into one. So everybody can learn these success habits, right? Like we, uh, there's nothing special about anything that I do with any of my clients. But those, those fundamental aspects of sustained high performance, what we have to get right. And this comes back, like you mentioned, to that, to that burnout aspect. And so there are two... Uh, primary ways in which we look for burnout to happen. And, and, you know, typically we go much deeper dive into all of this, but, but the two most important that we see is leadership is a never ending journey. And so if we don't prepare ourselves for that, I have to be better today than I was yesterday because people are counting on me to do that. If we don't wake up every day with that as a focus, that can be a trigger for burnout. The second is that burnout tends to happen predominantly between, between crises, right? Like I accomplished one mission and I've accomplished this other mission or I have this other mission that's coming, but that space in between can be the time where leaders are like, well, I don't know who I am if I'm not living in crisis or if I'm not trying to put out fires. And so they, they manufacture these issues in their life. And then all of a sudden, what do you know? They're so tired of dealing with issues that they can't focus on the right things and they become susceptible to burnout. So we really have to work on in the midst of stuff going bad around us. How does the leader maintain their internal compass of integrity and morality between crises or in the midst of a crisis that they can continue to lead successfully, not just for themselves, but ultimately for those around them? Wow, how, how powerful. Now, you mentioned you started off working really with, you know, pastors and seeing people in ministry. Now, do you work with people other than pastors? I, I do. And that's part of, that's part of the evolution of, of my own coaching business, right? When I started getting coaches training, I reached out to my pastor friends and said, hey, I'm doing this right now for a school project. I don't have any real 
goals or ambitions with this, would you let me coach you for a semester, you know, for whatever it was, 30 documentable hours, and I can get your feedback. And so I had three, four, five pastors that I was coaching. And at the end of that, I was like, man, I really kind of enjoyed that. But I could already sense there, my life was, was starting to shift. And so I said, I loved coaching pastors. But as I dug into that, I realized I loved coaching pastors that were trying to do something entrepreneurial. And so I said, well, maybe I should coach entrepreneurs. And so I started to coach entrepreneurs. And there was something about that that was like, that's one step even more in the right direction than pastors. But it, so it's not pastors. And it's not quite like entrepreneurs with just an idea. I care about, you know, somebody who's actually already making these inroads. And so that's where I just began to hunker down on business owners. And so while I say I coach business owners, the benefit of that is I work in such a wide variety of platforms that, that I'm amazed at the, the sheer number of contacts I've gotten and industries I've gotten to learn about. At the same time, I tell all of my clients, I'm never going to be the industry expert in whatever it is you provide. But I don't have to be because the goal is to help you, is to help show you how you are the expert. And so real estate, family services, family businesses, uh, entrepreneurs, pool cleaning, uh, roofing, like you name it, uh, CEO, uh, CFO of an oil company. Like I can work with anybody in a business setting because you are the expert. I'm this sounding board to help you determine, hey, we're on the right path, right? That, that the more you rise up a ladder in an organization, the fewer people you have to talk to, the fewer people you have to bounce ideas off of, I become that person. And so I don't have to be the expert. And I work on a wide variety of platforms to help people succeed. Yeah. Well, right. And, and I think that's so true, right? You, you mentioned everything from, you know, oil executives to roofing. And the neat thing about what you're doing is it doesn't matter if it's a barrel of oil or a shingle on the roof. If you got the right mindset, if you're tweaking that, Absolutely. the way you think about oil or air conditioning or whatever industry you're in, that's going to be fundamentally different. And, and so I think that's what's neat about what you bring to the table is, it, is its mindset, right? And, and that's applicable to you no matter what industry you're in, no matter mm -hmm. what you're doing. It, it's how do you think about the industry that you're in? So as you were growing and building out your consulting business, what are some of the mindset shifts that you had to go through? And what did you learn from some of those experiences? Yeah, so one of those big ones, and again, it goes back to that mindset idea, is you have to know who you're not going to serve, right? And there's this basic belief, I, I think all coaches go through this, and maybe all entrepreneurs to some degree, right? You, you have this great idea if you're an entrepreneur for this product, and you're like, well, who's your target market? Everybody, everybody can benefit from what I'm going to do. Well, maybe, <laughs> but, but you can't market to everybody, right? And as a coach, I can coach anybody and everybody. The principles I learned in coaching will apply to everybody, maybe. But then I got my first bad client. And I was just like, man, I hated calling this guy. Like every Thursday at one o'clock is forever ingrained in my head. Like it still just makes me, ugh, I hate Thursdays at one o'clock because I, I, I think back five years ago, having to call Adam and like, ugh, okay, here we go. Because I knew the, the, he wasn't willing to put in the work, right? And so that's the next evolution of my own coaching business is it's not just business owners, it's business owners with the right mindset. And so, you know, uh, along the way, one of those big things that I've had to tell my clients is I can do and will do everything in my power to help you succeed. In fact, my success is based solely on your success, right? That's how our relationship continues. The one thing I can't bring to this relationship is your desire to change. You, you get everything else that I have access to, and I'll give you whatever tools and resources and, and speaking engagements and notes and books and whatever I feel like can help. I'll extend your sessions, but you have to want to change. And for the entrepreneur, for the business owner, you have to want to change. You have to want to get better. You have to wake up and say, my, my spouse is counting on me. My kids are counting on me. My employees are counting on me. I need to show up today and be the best darn person I can be because there are a lot of people that are writing on this. Yeah, so, so true. I was talking with another consultant who's real deep in the dental industry just yesterday, and he was sharing a story about two practices, same town, about same revenues, and he's coaching both of them. He said, this practice over here, 
like I said, they are killing it. They're doing amazing. They're up, you know, 30, 40%. He said, this practice over here is just barely making it by, right? And he says, I'm doing the same stuff, same systems, same everything. I said, well, well what's the difference? He said, the practice that's killing it, they want to change. He says, yep. I give them an idea, a strategy, a tactic, and they do it. He says, I give this practice the same strategy, tactic, idea, and then I say, how's it coming? And they go, oh, we haven't done that yet. So, so I think your desire to change and what you're talking about is so important. And if you're, if you're listening to this, I think that's one of the fundamental things you have to answer for yourself is, do you want to change? Do you want to get better? So as you start thinking about, you know, the, the, the kind of the challenges that you see that, that get in the way, right? We touched on burnout a little bit. What are some of the other challenges and struggles and issues that you're seeing business owners and entrepreneurs go through today? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the big ones, and again, I've realized this because it's been my own journey. Uh, years in counseling and years in professional coaching will help pull your own dark stuff out, right? <laughs> and you're forced to work on it. But one of those big ones I, I've noticed uh, is, is what I've come to call this inner critic, right? We, we all have one. And for some of us, it's just bigger than others. But it's this, it's this person that, that gives you all of the reasons why you can't. And one of the ways I intentionally work with my business owners is we, I mean, we have an entire two weeks in our initial 12-week session. So we dedicate a sixth of our first kind of block of chunks together to defeating that internal negative critic. What is it like when he shows up? What does he say? What are the lies that he's telling you? What are all the ways he's going to warn you that this is going to fail? Because, you know, hey, look at all these other times that you failed, right? And retraining the way your brain actually thinks about failure and about the opportunity that lies in front of you is, is, one, of those, is one of those big ones. And, uh, you, you know, tying that back into the last point, uh, I, when I talk with somebody, one of those big indicators for me is this idea of growth is if you're making 100,000 a year and you're like, Justin, I, my boss said I should get, should get a coach. Would we coach well together? And I say, well, what's one of your, you know, what's one of your goals? Well, I'm doing pretty good. I'd like to keep making 100,000 this year. I'm like, yeah, you probably need a coach, but it's not going to be me. You make 100,000 this year. I work with people that say, my goal is to make 300,000. My goal is to make 500,000, right? This idea of, I know that I'm capable of more. And my goal is not sustainability on a plateau. It's continued growth. I should be able to sustain my growth over the next 50 years, not just sustain a plateau like I've reached my peak. I want people who are looking to continue to get better. And that means we're going to address some of those negative habits as well as building in the positive right ones. Well, so, so I, what I hear you saying is, you know, the people that you work best with are not the people who say, hey, I just want to maintain what I'm doing, but I want to take what I'm doing and I know I'm capable of more. I just don't know how to get there. Yes, ab absolutely. Yeah, well, it, it, and it's interesting that you mentioned kind of the, the money piece, because I know so often that's probably what you may hear when people come for coaching is a lot of times we focus in monetary goals, right? I want to grow my revenues by this. I want to make this much more money this year. I want to, you know, serve this many more clients, right? It's so number focused. And, and how do you deal with some of those number things and also that internal critic, right? How, how do you work with that setting goals and, and trying to get better and better and better? But then if you don't hit them, that internal critic can come in and say, well, yeah, you know, look at how poorly you did. You didn't even reach the goals that you set. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that the, the numbers, the, the numeric growth, right? Let, let's take revenue because I used it as the example. I, I'm a firm believer that revenue follows a repeatable pattern of us doing the right things. That, that if we are engaged in the right tasks, if, if I as a business owner am doing the most valuable, the most profitable things to my business that don't necessarily have to be related to money, I think money tends to follow itself. Uh, I was talking with a business owner yesterday and in the midst of all of this, you know, one of my, I was uh, interviewing him for my podcast and I said, you know, what's one of the changes that you've had to make? And he said, I spend so much more time with my employees, coaching them up. In terms of bottom line, you can't see that as a profitability statement, right? You, you can't say, well, I, I, I coached Jane for 30 minutes and that made me a thousand dollars. But what you can see is that 
Jane provides better customer service, their customers are more likely to come back. And in the midst of all of this, their business is growing, right? And so he's not necessarily focused on, I mean, he is as a business owner, right? We all are. How do I make money? But I'm this firm believer that if we nail the right things that only I can be doing, right? That's the sustained high performance success aspect. If I continue to do, to do those things, all of these number metrics that matter to me are going to follow themselves. And even if they don't, and this is, I think, is the brilliant thing that people miss. Even if they don't, that at least initially, that's the power of how you silence the inner critic, mm. right? I know that I am doing what I was put on this earth to do. And man, I am, I am so happy. How many entrepreneurs do we know that like, you know what? I left a job that was paying me four times more than what I'm making right now. I'm just so happy I get to wake up and do what I love doing every day. You couldn't pay me enough to go back to this other company. Wow. I, if you're listening right now, I, I would suggest you pause, rewind it, and re-listen to what Justin just said. That, that is such wisdom for you to, to take in and, and meditate on. That, that is so powerful. Wow, Justin. I, I, I love that framework, right? The difference in, in the way we silence our internal critic is we know that we're working on the things that matter, right? We're working on what we were placed here to do. So, so seriously, rewind and re-listen to that and ingrain that in your head. So powerful. Now, touching on the, the things we should be doing, the high value activities, you know, as a business owner myself, and, and you may be listening too, you may struggle knowing right what are the right activities. Because I know so often I feel like if I could get out of my way, I could get a whole heck of a lot more done. And so, so how do you work with, with helping people focus on what the important activities are so that they are doing those high value activities? Yeah, yeah. Now, so uh, I say this and as background, you have to know, I to my core, my, my soul was created off of checklists. Like if I can, I, I'm the type of person that like does things that aren't on the checklist and then I'll write them down just so I can feel good about myself and check them off. So like as background into my personality, you have to know that. But this shift for me began when I started to realize that I, I could look at my checklist and I would say, man, I got 50 things done today. I just don't feel like any of it made a difference. Yeah, I got 50 things done, but of what consequence, right? And so for me as, as a person, right? And this goes back to this idea of burnout. I am more than just what I can make or do or produce. I'm more than just a business owner. Uh, I'm a husband to my wife, Elise. We met in college. We've got 14 years together. That relationship matters. I am a father to four fantastic kids. I'm a brother. I'm a son, I'm a friend, I'm a community member, I am all sorts of things that cannot be defined by what brings in income. And so I would accomplish 50 things, be like, yeah, but which of those really matter? And so I, I began to make this shift about saying, how do we get things done that, that actually matter? That if I could get to the end of my day and say, I only got three things done, or I only got five things done, but I know for a fact those three things made a huge impact on who I'm becoming, I feel much better about those three things. And honestly, I like for Saturdays and Sundays, my checklist typically includes things like you're going to make pancakes and then watch cartoons with the kids because that matters to me more on a Sunday morning than shooting off a sales email Sunday at 8 a.m., right? Nobody's going to see that. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to reward me for hustling harder by shooting out an email Sunday morning. But my kids will notice that I wasn't with them. Yeah. And I have to decide what matters most. And so we take this totality of your humanity and say, who are you becoming in and out of the office, right? That's that sustained success. You can't falter in one area and succeed in the rest. They've all got to come along together. And so we focus on these, uh, what I call these four quadrants to help you get to the end of your day and be like, yeah, I got the right stuff done today. That was a good day. Hmm. Excellent. So, so powerful. Now, earlier we were also talking a little bit and, you know, teamwork matters too, right? Teamwork among your, your team, the, the people you engage with, your employees. And, and there's an interesting story you have between uh, Lincoln and General Grant that really kind of focuses on teamwork that I think can be transformative for, your, for people's business. Would you, yeah. would you want to share that? Yeah. So, I, I am a, a huge Civil War fan, and I will, I will geek out on this stuff. I'll keep my response short. But I, 
the short, shortest possible version of the story is I love Lincoln and, and the things that he stood for and the way that he emerged as a leader. You look at his backstory and everybody just discredited him. And this guy is a bumbling idiot. What a fool. He looks like he's pretty stupid. We can't trust him to do anything. And yet, time and time again, through repeatable practices, he emerged as widely regarded our greatest president in our, in our history. But when it comes to teamwork, if you look at the beginning part of the Civil War, what we notice is that the people around Lincoln not only doubted him, but they were often very open and adamant in their critique. Lincoln, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, so, so President Lincoln would, would issue a battle plan. Hey, I think we should go south and attack. And his generals would say, you're an idiot. And they would go west and attack. And they would lose. And Lincoln continued to cycle through top generals and couldn't get any traction. For a while, it looked like the South was going to win the Civil War. But then this little forgotten general in this forgotten part of the Civil War named Ulysses Grant started to win and started to get some attention. And President Lincoln would send him a note and say, hey, why don't you try this? And Grant would do it and they would win and they would have success and would gain the momentum and it would gain Lincoln some notoriety and it would gain him some good publicity. And by the end of the Civil War, what you see are not just two well-respected generals and presidents uh, and a future president. You see men that had a deep love and, and admiration for each other that Lincoln exhibited this, hey, here is what we're trying to accomplish. And Grant was in the right place at the right time and said, I'm going to charge through that battle. And if you look at some of the neuroscience on, on teamwork, we're actually wired to perform better in teams. And I think Lincoln and Grant mimic that very well. When you have the right people in the right place, right, the, the famous Jim Collins saying, the right people in the right place, good things happen. And Lincoln and Grant, even so far as openly in a positive way, criticizing each other, but then also apologizing when they are wrong. We, we have a letter from President Lincoln that says, Grant, I thought you should go one way and you went the other. You were right, I was wrong. The President of the United States admitting, guys, I really messed this up and we should thank my team member who did more than their fair sh share part, right? Leadership and, and teamwork matters, even in those small little issues of integrity. Hmm. Oh, how powerful, right? And, and I think, Right. The thing I appreciate about that story is the fact that you had a leader willing to say, I was wrong. I, and I think so often that, that that's missing in organizations today because, you know, I'm guessing you see it too. Many leaders, and you may be listening, thinking, well, I, I've got to always show my best side forward. I can't make mistakes in front of my team instead right. of really demonstrating humility. And failure isn't always necessarily a bad thing, is it either, Justin? Uh, it, no, it, it's not. Sometimes it's, it, it's a tremendous learning opportunity, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. So uh, I'm sure your audience reads. I'll throw out a book now because I told you off camera I wouldn't stick to just one. <laughs> uh, there's a book by Dan Ream called Thrive by Design, and it's the neuroscience of teamwork, uh, of, of how teams work. And in the book, he talks about these three levels of leadership. And the first is what he calls leadership 1.0. It's, I'm the leader and you're going to do what I say, right? I remember when I was young and I had an older brother that would babysit me. The rule was when he says jump, my response is how high, <laughs> right? Like he is the leader and what he go says. And Dan just kind of pointed out in his book, that doesn't cut it anymore. Then leadership 2.0 was this charismatic leadership. If we put the right person in leadership, and they're, they're charismatic and they're gifted at speaking the right, um, you know, maybe they can influence the markets and increase sales and yeah, everybody kind of gets along. And he's like, that doesn't cut it anymore. Instead, he's advocating in his book for what he's calling Leadership 3.0. And this idea of the leader now looks at the team hmm. and says, what's best for this team? And that may mean that I have to be wrong and I need to listen to them. It's this collective wisdom that we share together is so much more than what any one person can accomplish themselves. And he says the neuroscience, the, the brain scans show, we do better that way. And so leaders, business owners, organizations will all thrive when they put people in place who say, my overriding concern is the success of my team. Because when they win, I'm going to win too. Wow. 
Wow, very, very powerful stuff, Justin. Wow, I, I mean, I can just, I, I'm walking away with so many nuggets of wisdom. And if you're listening, I, I hope you're paying attention because this is just gold. These things can absolutely transform your business, your life. They can help you be such a much better leader for your organization. And, and I, I want to come back and touch on, you know, really kind of that, that first theme that we have, which is, you know, knowing the value that you bring to your business, to your organization. I, how can leaders really work on discovering what that value is. We, we've certainly danced around some of them, but I want to really kind of drill down it and make it really implicit. How do you find the value that you're bringing to your business? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the hardest growth for, at least in the people that I have coached, so I, I won't make a blanket statement. I will say my history with clients. The hardest growth is those businesses that have become established and have a routine typically with a solopreneur that starts to add staff, right? Because as a solopreneur starting up, you do everything. You run in the Facebook campaigns and you're out doing the sales letters and you're shooting off emails and you're completing the work orders. And then you hire somebody and you have to let go of something. And in the people that I have worked with traditionally, that shift has been very hard. And so we start to look at and say, where is the value of your time? For example, if you can prove to me that, that when you work, it's worth $50 an hour, and you're still running your own books, right? I'm still writing all of my, I'm still handwriting all of my checks. That's, you're paying yourself $50 an hour. If you can find somebody who's willing to do that for $20 an hour, you're going to save $30 an hour. But more than that, you can now also do other tasks, stuff that actually will bring in that $50 in that hour, and you can compound that success. And so we really step back and say, look, the problem with checklists, as much as I love them, is if you write them all down, they all look the same, right? I've got 50 things to do today, and if I give them all the same weight, that's where you end up like I was by saying, did I really get something of consequence done? So, so I walk my clients through you can't accomplish it all. Instead, you can accomplish three, maybe five things that will really make a difference. And we work through a process because unfortunately it doesn't happen overnight of starting to outsource the rest, right? What are the things that I can do today that bring the most impact on who I'm becoming, on who my team needs me to be, and on the services I'm trying to provide, right? Small business owners care about their community. How can I uplift my community the most? then you're gonna to have to start letting go of tasks. And so we start to find ways like, you know what, I can probably let go of billing or I can probably let go of Facebook campaigns because while it's an investment to hire somebody to do that, ultimately I'm gonna be in such a good groove and bringing more impact, I'll pay that $20 an hour because of not just the money that I save and bring in, but the joy I get from doing the right things the right way. Yeah, wow, very, very powerful stuff, Justin. And if you're listening, once again, I hope you're taking notes on this. This is, this is gold. This is so good for you to really have that impact, to start thinking about you know, the value that you're bringing to your organization, how you're impacting your employees and the customers and really making that difference in the world. And so, Justin, as we start coming to a close now, right? We were joking before, right? Sharing a couple books. You're like me, you've got a list of a gazillion. But you know, what have been some transformational books? I, I guess I'll change it this way. You know, what have been some books that have really transformed you and helped shifted your mindset the most? As, as you think back to your journey and some of those books that you've read, what, what were some of those big aha moments that you had when you were interacting with those authors and, and, and what were those books? And you can name yeah. more than one. Oh, oh good. <laughs> um, so I am a, uh, I'll just throw this out there. I'm a huge fan of history, particularly American history. And so uh, if there's a book on the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, you should probably read it <laughs> because the insights of what our country was facing then and what we're going through now are uncanny. But one book to get you started that, that I love, I have structured a master's class around this book uh, at a university because I think it's such a fundamental principle is a book called Forged in Crisis by Nancy Cohn. Uh, she profiles five amazing leaders throughout history and how they focused on getting the right things done in order to leave a lasting impact on the world. And of course, she covers uh, Lincoln in that book. That was one of the first ways I got to dabble in, in Lincoln several years ago when I read that book. Uh, so there's one. 
Uh, there's another called Trillion Dollar Coach by Bill Campbell about how you coach executives and teams uh, and uh, what it means to just call the crap when boards get together or teams get together and, and how to do so in a way that allows people to quite clearly see, hey, we're really not being entirely truthful and honest here. Uh, the, the man, Bill Campbell, that they follow in this story really did an amazing job of helping teams like Google and Apple reach the level that they're, uh, that they're at today. And then of course, I mentioned it earlier, I'll throw out a third one, Thrive by Design by Don Ream. If you are in any way leading a team, if you're in any way trying to influence people in a key leadership position, understanding how the brain works and what we can do to lift those up around us, uh, that's a fantastic place to start. And that one was Thrive by Design? Thrive by Design, yeah. Excellent. I'll put those, those links in the, in the show description for everyone so you can check those out. Where can our audience connect with you, Justin, if they want to learn more about what you've got going on? Where can we find yeah. you? Uh, I am on all of the social medias, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. They're all at JS Hebert. You can find me there. Uh, JustinHebert.com is my domain name. It, it's the host place where I post blog posts and YouTube videos and uh, do my own podcast and all of those sorts of things that my goal is to provide as much resource for people there as uh, for free as I possibly can. Okay. Uh, that, I, that I want you to walk away from that experience being like, hey, I've got things that I can go and do and implement. Right. And so justinheber.com is a great place to go and just find all of that stuff. All right. Now, now on there, you actually have a leadership course that people can enroll in, correct? I do. So I, I've taken, uh, in, in my coaching practice, somebody wants to work with me. We, the first 12 weeks is, is always set in stone. We've got something to accomplish. And if you go to my website, there's a free five-day e-course version of that, where obviously we may not go quite as in-depth, but I'll give you all of those same success principles that I teach my executive business owners. This is how you make sure you're getting the right things done the right way to have the most amount of impact. Right. And, and all for no charge. Talk about right. incredible value. I would encourage you, go download this. I, I know I'm certainly going to go through it, right? Anything that you can do to improve as a leader for your organization is so worth doing it. And so some great resources. We know how to contact you. What are some closing thoughts for us, Justin? What, what are some next steps, right? Next steps coaching. What's the next thing that someone listening to this can go do? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll say this, this has been, this has been the big one on my heart lately for the, for the people that I work with. We are, uh, right on the eve of quarter four of 2020, right? And, and this has just been such a crazy year for us that, that everybody has been affected, even those that are doing well. And so one of the things that I, that I told myself months ago, uh, was, uh, I, I, I may have to live through this but I can choose the impact that it has on me. And I, I couldn't choose to not stay home, right? Following orders, trying to, trying to help those around me that are loved, that are high risk, and, and all of the stuff that's going on. And, you know, without trying to get political and all of this stuff, it's affected everybody. And so I started to use, use the phrase in the midst of this, what can I do today that will get me better and not bitter? Hmm. And to really just, if, if I can bless those people around me, if, if I'm getting better today, then I can help other people get better. But if I'm getting more bitter, 2020 is just going to feel a whole lot longer than it really is. And so uh, I hope people listening uh, can, can walk away, if, if nothing else, and just say, go do one thing today to get better. Hmm. Read a book if you haven't read one in a while. Listen to a podcast if you haven't. Stop working and go be with somebody you love, right? Like whatever it is, look at the totality of who you are and do one thing today that will make you better tomorrow. Wow, so powerful. So I'm Tim McNeely. We've been talking with Justin Hebert. And we set out today to really give you so that you know the value that you bring to your business. We've absolutely covered that. We've shared with you some strategies so that you can have maximum impact on the people you work with, your employees, your customers, potential customers, and even more importantly, your family and your loved ones. And hopefully you feel even more in control right now because of some of the things that you've learned. And so it's one thing to listen to this podcast. It's one thing to absorb the information. But what, you, what I want you to do, what I want to encourage you to do is get out there and do it. And if you do that, you're going to make it a great day.
Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Dentalpreneur Secrets.